Ivan wa ahlan bakum fi baranamij dakal Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum Robert Satloff. Ada mayakun fasil saif wa qtal raha wa istirkha wa utlat wa lakin hadha saif sayakun muhtalafan. His banal siasian il hizb demokrati wa al hizb al jumhuri sayalta kan fi Philadelphia wa Cleveland. La akad muatamarat his bia kaumia kanta kun el akthar sakban wa rubama el akthar unfan fi el tarikh el hadith. Sa tabda tilka la akdath is sebak el nehei lil riasa wa hiya hamla sa takun kasia. Fi itar sa ina la taudikh melamech el nadam el siyasi el ameriki sa nugati. Kul janib mi juanib tilkal hamla. Walekin do una le nansa sarian el aura el hakima eleti adla beha el kathir min du yufna ala madar el amel modi. Bitilkal rauh, jamaatna hadahil maljmua min lafkar wa rua el amika min halakat el barnamij bundu seif el modi. Naamil an tadif itaran wa fahaman la taghiratuna wa yomia la hamla intikhabatuna el riasiya. There's a debate that goes back and forth in, uh, over the decades. Um, uh, uh, successful foreign service officer is A, a sound manager, a good generalist, um, understands the world, etc., and B, is um, a regional specialist, right. knows his country, knows the language. What's right? Well, I mean, I, I found, all I can speak to is my own experience, and I found having um, a foothold, in a sense, in two important, complicated, but very different parts of the world, in my case, Middle East and Russia, in terms of my overseas experience, was not only something that I found professionally rewarding, because there are two parts of the world that matter to the United States that are infinitely complicated to deal with, and where I think professional diplomats can uh, really perform a service. So in my experience, I think, you know, having more than one region that I focused on, you know, in the overseas part of my career was really valuable and it was also enjoyable to me because however difficult the policy issues were, I genuinely enjoyed working in those two parts of the world. In later stages in my career, especially my last couple of jobs in the State Department, you know, my horizons obviously broadened to cover, you know, the entire international landscape and the whole range of issues that the United States has to deal with. And I really enjoyed you know, the variety of the issues that I had to deal with as undersecretary and then as deputy secretary of state, even if I can't say that I enjoyed, you know, all the frustrations that came with some of those issues. Speaking of frustrations, um, if you could wave a magic wand, fix some part of the State Department, the Foreign Service, uh, what would it be? How would you do it? Oh, I, it's a... Uh, it's, I guess I give a couple of answers to that. First, I, I wish, and this is something that I think, you know, professional American diplomats need to do a better job at. I wish there was a, a better understanding in American society, as well as on Capitol Hill in the American Congress, of the role that diplomats play and the value that I really do believe that we, all of my colleagues currently serving in the Foreign Service and in the State Department, um, can bring in promoting American interests and values around the world. Um, it's not as well understood as it should be, and we need to do a better job in explaining ourselves um, to the American public. Related to that is the issue of resources. It's oftentimes been harder for the State Department to find the budgetary resources that we need to do our jobs well overseas. And those two issues are connected. Explaining ourselves a little bit more effectively, I think, can you know, help produce um, you know, that kind of budgetary support. I think we occasionally are our own worst enemies in the State Department in the sense that we, over time, I think we've, we've become kind of over-bureaucratized in some sense. Uh, staffs have increased in Washington, especially the higher up you get in the State Department. And I think, um, you know, over time it would be good to streamline some of that as well um, because I think it would uh, put us in a position where we could make a more effective case to the Congress and to the American public about 
how we're making the best possible use of the budgetary resources that we get. You, you are quite active in following this. Um, do you think that international businesses are looking at Iran and saying, hmm, great market, let's jump in, or are they saying, well, all those uh, terrorism and human rights sanctions are still on Iran, it's a messy, risky place, not worth it. Yeah, I, I, I think the legitimate actors, th those that are risk averse, um, are, are going to be waiting uh, because there, there are a lot of variables at play and a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty with how the deal plays out. What will the U.S. Congress say and do? Uh, what will Iran do in this context? Um, and how will the sanctions actually work and the unwinding work? Will there be snapback, the potential for the U.S. and the, the P5 plus one, the, the negotiating parties, to actually reimpose these sanctions? How does that play out? And then you also have the, the political reality that you have a, a presidential transition coming up in the U.S. Uh, with the reality that this is, this is an agreement that's not a treaty, it's an executive agreement, meaning the new president could alter the agreement uh, if they so choose. And so um, there are, there's all sorts of uncertainty around the deal itself and how this works. To your point, there's also a great deal of uncertainty around the risks. So even if sanctions were to be completely lifted, there's a really important set of questions around what's the risk of doing business in Iran, as you would evaluate in any country? What's the role of the government in the economy? What is the role of the security services in controlling major uh, and, and strategic parts of the economy? Um, what's the co concern over corruption and money laundering? These are international concerns. And so even if you were to get over the uncertainty of the sanctions unwinding, you have the uncertainties of the risks of doing business in Iran. No doubt, though, there's going to be pressure uh, to go in. The oil sector, no doubt, will want to get in quickly. The manufacturing, construction uh, sector, and certain other uh, segments like the automaker uh, industry, Peugeots of the world may want to get in. Uh, but the banks of the world and these others that have been very risk averse are going to wait, and they're going to wait and see. And I think there's going to be a period of great uncertainty for a couple of years before you see uh, the markets really opening up for Iran. I did want to ask you about one phenomenon that uh, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's how deep it is yet, but we, we've spoken on the show before about the influence of money in politics. Have we made too much about big money in politics? Well, I think money is still pretty important. <laughs> and uh, what we're likely to see ultimately is a Democratic nominee and a Republican nominee who are both extremely well financed. So I'm not really too concerned about either one of them being unable to get his or her message out. I think the problem for me is more at the congressional level, where not everybody's being that successful, and also where we see the effects of big party machines really you know, trying to organize votes along party block lines much more than before, and where gerrymandering has also exacerbated the problem, the way we draw congressional districts. So I think that's where the greater problem is in my mind. Well, one thing, you know, if we, we, we get getting back to letdowns, but I think this is an issue that's going to be an even more dominant one, is guns. Mm -hmm. uh, every time we have an incident where you have assault weapons and massive uh, armaments used, that people who on the surface shouldn't be able to have easy access to them get them, we get another uh, uprising. How can we possibly do this? And then almost nothing happens. <laughs> Let me ask you about a topic which um, uh, bridges between uh, uh, in an international concern and a domestic concern, and that is immigration. Um, it's an international concern. If you hear, um, uh, for example, Donald Trump saying our borders are being flooded and, and uh, threats are entering our country, um, and it's also a domestic concern. Um, what is the conservative ideal on immigration? America as a welcoming country or an America as a country that has big walls on its borders? Well, some of both, and obviously American history has some of both, to be, to be honest. I think the conservative ideal is more on the welcoming country side, but I also think people have concerns about unlimited immigration or excessive immigration or illegal immigration. 
And those concerns aren't ridiculous. No country in the world simply allows anyone to sh come at any time, uh, I don't think, and uh, simply show up there. So, uh, and, and having people come in illegally is a problem, obviously, in all kinds of ways. We have laws that are supposed to regulate the amount of immigration total and who comes from where, and then suddenly a whole bunch of people come across the border. And I'm not for kicking the ones who are here uh, already out, but obviously we, have to, we can't just leave the border open. It has terrible effects. So I, I think it's become a very emotional debate here, which is probably unfortunate. Um, I don't think our problem is nearly as bad as Europe's problem, though, with the migration crisis. And the truth is the single best thing we can do about about the immigration problem here is help people abroad live better lives there. So with Mexico, I think actually the problem is subsiding because Mexico has pretty good economic policies and is getting a little more stable, a few exceptions. And obviously in Europe, we have, they have a horrible crisis now with migration, but that's caused entirely by the disastrous effects of the Syrian civil war and the spillover into Iraq and so forth. So um, it does, as you say, it's a case where foreign policy and domestic policy uh, damage each other. I think the worst thing that could happen would be, I don't think any public, though, is going to simply say, well, you know, the world's in chaos, so we just have to let our country be flooded by poor immigrants who don't share much in the way of background or culture or values necessarily. And I think we will see a backlash against that. You're seeing it in Europe. You're seeing it here. It's not, you know, it's easy for people sitting in fancy apartment buildings in Manhattan or in nice places in Los Angeles to say, well, it's, there shouldn't be a backlash. But you know, if you're someone in a working class area and you're losing a job to such a person or your school suddenly is 40% immigrants and they, they can't, you know, the teachers can't keep the classes in order and your, stu your, your child is being, I don't know, pushed around by some kids who don't share, weren't brought up in the same culture that, that your kids were, uh, that's a real problem. So I, I think it's, it's not going away as a problem. And I'd say Europe really is gonna be the center of that discussion probably more than the United States. Because in both campaigns, Republican and Democratic, there is a, an anti-establishment uh, uh, battle cry. Um, well, the establishment is up for re-election in November. Um, uh, they can't enjoy hearing their candidates rail against them. How are they taking this? It's very difficult for them because on the one hand, they do not want to offend all these new energized voters that are coming out. On the other hand, someone who is polarizing at the top of the ticket might bring out someone, uh, all the rest of the voters to vote against them, and it will affect all the down ballot races, particularly when you're looking at states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, that have gone for Obama in the past in presidential elections. Those folks on those down, down ballot races are, have to be particularly nervous. You know, the, the Republican establishment, as it were, is scared to death that uh, a presidential nominee uh, of Donald Trump would be devastating, not just in losing the White House, but in causing them to lose the Senate, lose the Supreme Court, maybe even put the House of Representatives in jeopardy. And they're not clear what they're gonna do about it. One thing that will happen is outside billionaire uh, forces uh, who have a lot of money are gonna start to pour more of it into the Senate races. The Koch brothers uh, have amassed a war chest of close to a billion dollars. A lot of that money will go into those races. And there's even talk among some Republicans, if Trump wins the nomination, of putting up an independent conservative candidate, even though that would guarantee the loss of the White House, because it would energize some of their voters who might otherwise basically say, I don't have a choice, I'm not gonna vote to turn out so that they can win those down ballot races. So, uh, one aspect of this that I find interesting is that after San Bernardino, the pendulum really didn't swing back as one might have expected to the uh, security side of this debate. Uh, not nearly as much as one, uh, as at least I might have thought, that, that uh, the privacy side of the debate found itself with pretty strong roots and holding firm. Yeah, well, it's been interesting to watch it play out. And I guess it depends on when you're sort of checking in, because there's clearly a lot of stuff that's happening in this space. I mean, just uh, recently, you saw some legislation being introduced in the US Congress about this um, from the two leaders of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And that would effectively ban this kind of unbreakable encryption in consumer devices and force companies to have some way 
you know, undetermined, there's no mandate on what kind of way, but some way to turn it over to the U.S. government if they have a warrant. And so that's something that is now real. This is now a real thing that people on both sides can fight over, um, something that people can actually mobilize around um, either way. And you'll actually, hopefully, start to see this kind of public debate that people have been calling for. Um, I think that the case of San Bernardino was such a high profile and extreme case and the fact that it was a terror attack on, or terror inspired attack at least on U.S. soil and so that does raise the stakes and that is not lost on law enforcement or the American public that this is something that, you know, people, everybody wants that case to be solved. Everybody wants that idea, you know, the idea of law enforcement being able to solve these crimes. It's just a question of, well, if you do take these steps to solve that, what are you trading off in society? And there's really not a consensus on that yet. And um, the polls that I've seen, at least, are pretty split. And um, I think that these issues, especially on the other side, on the side of um, encryption, are in some ways more complicated to explain rather than just, hey, there are bad guys. Let's get them and give us all the tools we need to get them. It's sort of the, well, if this, then all of these other things might happen to your privacy and your consumer security. Um, I think that's a little bit harder to explain, but we'll have to see you know, what comes out of the, the bill floating now in Congress and um, really just the public debate and other court cases like the one in New York that are going for now. And have, uh, have our presidential candidates, um, who obviously are deep into all the issues in the, in the, uh, as we've seen in our campaign, um, have they uh, pronounced on this? They have said things here and there. I have not really seen a fully nuanced uh, discussion of this topic. Um, several of them on both sides have come out to say that the government should have some sort of access, just generally, that there should be this there should be a discussion about the trade-offs, but um, in terms of specifics, uh, you know, you, I think you might start to see that later on in the campaign. Uh, you've given us one piece of good news where you think that uh, uh, collectively we stand a good chance of, of dealing with the energy and climate change issue. That's what I heard you say. Um, any other good news we should, uh, we should pin our hopes on over the next decade? You know, Rob, uh, five or six years ago, my column appears in Shakal um, uh in Arabic. It's a real big thrill and honor for me. And uh, it was five or six years ago, they sent a reporter to interview me in my Washington office. And we did the interview. About halfway through, he said, now, Mr. Friedman, I have a question for you. It's very controversial with our readers. You supported the Iraq war, albeit for democracy reasons. What do you have to say now? And I said to him, he was a young man, he was, I believe, a Lebanese who had grown up in Saudi Arabia, nice young man. And I said to him, please tell your readers I'm sorry. I believed Arabs were capable of, in need of, and desirous of democracy. I was wrong. I apologize. And his face went kind of blank. And we got done. He said to me privately, he said, uh, don't say that. Don't say that. And I was only doing it to be provocative because I still believe. That's why I've never apologized for wanting that to be part of the Iraq war. I've never done, I've sinned, I'm sorry. Please let me write you know, for you know, uh, left-wing organizations again. I don't apologize for believing Arabs are in need of, desirous of, and capable of building a democratic context. But they're going to have to fight for it. They're going to have to fight for it every day and it's going to have to start with them. And when it does, we can amplify it. And that's why my American foreign policy now is contain it where we have disorder, amplify it where we see real examples of it, and innovate at home so America continues to be a model that people want to emulate. And uh, uh, when we look over the next 10 years, we've just had one of the most consequential American uh, national security decisions uh, in, uh, on Iran. Uh, do you see this as uh, the potential for uh, uh, an area where democracy takes hold? Or do you see the Iran agreement as providing a tool for the regime actually to firm up yeah. its control of the people? I think it's going to be a real fight. Um, anyone who tells you it's all one or all the other and it's a sure thing, don't believe a word they say. I think it's going to be a real fight, Rob, and I don't know the answer to that question. But I'm going to go back to what I said before. I believe in Moore's law. I believe in human nature. And I believe in mother nature. 
And any time you're running against those, to me, you're, 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 you're going to have the wind in your face. I do believe there's a party we have not heard from much in all these negotiations, but they're an important party, and it is the Iranian people. But I also believe they're up against an incredibly vicious regime, same regime that put down their Green Revolution, the same regime that is buttressing Assad's genocide in Syria, is going to be the same regime in power in Tehran the day before our Iran deal and the morning after, Bad Bukhra. And I have a motto also about the Middle East. All important politics in the Arab world happens bad bukra, the morning after, the morning after. And we're going to see that with the Iran deal. I know what I'm hoping for, but I would, it would be very reckless to make any predictions. Okay. Tom Friedman, excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Rob. you My very pleasure. much. Behava Nasilu el Nehea Tabahil Halka Min Baranamaj Dachel Washington. Ida Kenant Ledekum E Estaf Sarat, O Ta'ali Kat, Hawal Havahil Halka, Wa Khasatan Hawal Muktara Hatakum Le Islah Ma Fasad Fi Washington. Arjuan Tarasaluni Mubasharatan, Allah Anwam El Barid Electroni Itali, Inside Washington at El Hura.com. Makum Robert Satloff. Shukran lakum wa ila lakum.